yeah, as we just went over, I'm Harris Schneiderman. I work for DQ. Um, I'm also a member of the um, W3C ARIA working group. I'm actually going to stop my video feed to avoid all bandwidth issues. Um, but today we're going to be talking about translating design wireframes into accessible HTML and CSS. All right. So what we're going to cover today um, is how we can incorporate accessibility from the start, from the, you know, all the way from ideation through design phase, through development phase. Um, and specific to design phase, we're going to go over annotations and uh, the considerations you must make for accessibility. And we're going to map those to some mockups and how um, certain annotations can actually drive the output markup that de the developer is going to be implementing. And we're going to go over uh, passing off the, your designs to the development team. And uh, if possible, depending on the team dynamics, what you can actually keep your eye out on um, while it's being built. And that will transition us perfectly into the development phase uh, where we're going to talk about implementing accessible components as well as actually just testing for accessibility. So let's just get started. Accessibility from the start. Uh, we call that shifting left at DQ. Um, I've heard other terms for it, but the idea there is um, accessibility should should be incorporated even in the design phase. So that involves usability testing um, with users with disabilities. Um, usability testing is a very common thing, but AT users are often over overlooked. So it's definitely a good idea to incorporate them to get that perspective. Um, and like I said, we're gonna be covering um, annotations and specifically we're gonna map out stuff like accessible names, labels, uh, tab sequence, reading order, uh, purpose of the element um, and all sorts of stuff like that. But part of the design phase um, that I think is really important is uh, having a pattern library, uh, having a bunch of tools at your fingertips to orchestrate an app out of your, your small reusable components is really important. And if those patterns and components have accessibility baked into them, then your job is a lot easier to, to make an accessible app. Um, in addition to that, uh, everyone has color palettes and uh, designers really like them, but um, you really need to take into consideration color contrast because if you don't, you're setting yourself up for defeat because the <laughs> available colors in your palette uh, aren't contrasting enough and then you're gonna cause some problems for um, certain users. And uh, another often overlooked aspect of the design phase is collaboration with the developers. Um, I've heard tons of stories about, you know, a, a design team building a wireframe and then just kind of tossing it off to a separate team over the fence plugging their ears and crossing their fingers that everything's going to be implemented properly. No, you should definitely be incorporating your developers in, in design review um, so they can provide their feedback, but it's, it's never a, a bad idea to be collaborating with your team. Um, and on that team note, I just want to go over a few things, uh, a few good practices that your team can actually uh, implement um, when you're considering accessibility. So uh, participating in empathy events is a really good idea. It uh, gives you different perspectives of how different users uh, with different types of dif disabilities um, interact with things. And I think it's really eye-opening. It's a really good experience for everyone to, to uh, see. So uh, we also, I've, I've, I'm gonna probably mention this like six other times, but please in in include users with disabilities in your uh, UX design. So like I said, that's usability testing. That's, that's just considering them when you're, when you're building something or coming up with a new idea. Um, and when you do have that idea, and you're mapping it out with comps or wireframes or whatever it may be, uh, make sure you're communicating the intent. You know, designs aren't just a, it shouldn't just be a presentation layer, just what you see. It's actually what you experience. Um, so you, you should be communicating this so the developers know what the intended behavior is and they can actually make it function as such. Um, I already went over pattern library. Just wanted to really harp on that. It's really important. Um, having accessible components makes your life really easy. Um, and on top of that, leveraging an accessibility automation library is great uh, because automating some of the low hanging fruit uh, can actually speed up your development process and uh, help you catch accessibility issues as early on in that process as possible. And that's what we mean by shift left. You, wanna, you don't want to find your accessibility defects in production and ideally not even in your dev server. The best you can do is actually ensure that you're shipping, you're, you're making a pull request if you're a developer with um, accessibility tests already haven't taken place. Um, and on that note, there's, there's some automation that you can do um, with device and assistive technology testing. You know, um, render your app in, in a mobile simulator or testing different browser and assistive technology pairings that you wanna support. Um, but as much of that that you can automate the better because that just speeds everything up. And uh, manage your accessibility defects systematically. 
what that means is if, if you have some QA finding accessibility defects or anyone really, and you're creating tickets and you're throwing them in the backlog, they shouldn't just sit there in the backlog. They're, they're defects. They're no different than any other defects that you might be encountering. Uh, so make sure that those get prioritized as such. And on top of that, you should be measuring your progress with that kind of thing. So if, if, you, if you can come up with some metrics, like say, you know, the last three sprints, we consistently um, added only two accessibility defects. In the future, we want to shoot for none. So then we can bring that up in our retrospectives and um, maybe pivot or tweak our process to, um, to stop shipping accessibility issues. So let's get into annotations and how we can communicate that intent. That's kind of this theme that I'm really harping on. Um, the first type I want to go over are widget annotations. Um, and let me just, we're going to be looking at the same wireframe with different annotations for the next few slides. So I want to describe what this, uh, what this set of components are. Uh, so we're looking at a, uh, presumably an audio player control with a previous track, a play pause and a next track um, component. And so the widget annotations are really going to go over uh, the purpose, like the role of the given component, as well as the accessible name. And what we mean by that is, is what will um, AT read out when a user interacts with that content. So I'm going to go through each of the three controls and then actually step into the, the wrapping element. Um, so the previous track is a button, and its name is previous track. And in the current state that we're viewing, it's disabled. And um, I'm going to go to the play pause button to to actually describe why mapping that state out is important. Um, so the play pause button is currently playing because the pause button showing, and we're gonna get into that, the statefulness uh, in a couple slides, uh, but it is also a button and its name is pause currently and it's focusable. So the state on the previous track button is disabled, so it's not focusable and this one is focusable. So it's important that the designer is thinking about these things um, so the developer can implement it as such. Next, we have the next track button and it is also focusable and it's also a button. And uh, the wrapping element actually, an often overlooked aspect, is uh, we've decided that it should be a toolbar because that's what it actually is. And we're gonna give that toolbar an accessible name of player control. So when an AT user tabs into it, they actually hear the purpose of this group. Next up, we have interaction annotations. And as that would sound, it is um, basically describing the various interactions that this component will have. Um, so for the, for, for the buttons, um, we say space or enter equals a click. Disable the buttons cannot receive focus and disable buttons cannot respond to a click or touch. Uh, that first point about space or enter you get for free with a native HTML button. So I definitely wanna stress that that's uh, really important to do because you don't need to write some JavaScript to make it behave like a button. You can just use a button. Uh, but for the purpose of, of documenting this, we decided to, to put some of that information here. Um, and then we have some interaction for the entire component. Um, so some of this might seem pretty obvious, but I, I really think it's probably a good idea to map out the obvious just to ensure that everything's implemented properly. Um, so I'm going to go through all of these. So when we're on the first track of the, of the audio player, we'll disable the previous track button. There is no previous track. When we're on the last track, we'll disable the next track button. When we're playing the audio file, we'll display the pause button and hide the play button. When not playing, we'll display the play button and hide the pause button, obviously. Uh, but these last two points are really important um, because it's something you really got to be thinking about. It's a little tricky, uh, but we say after clicking play, we'll place focus on the pause button. After clicking pause, we'll place focus on the play button. And the reason that's really important is presumably we have two controls, right? Uh, a play button and a pause button. I know you can probably actually manipulate background images and stuff to use the same element, but let's pretend we got two elements. We have a play button and a pause button. I tab into the audio player. It, which is playing and it's and the accessible name is pause. I click that pause button. The JavaScript that I wrote is probably going to add display none or maybe even remove that pause button from the DOM. And remember that was focused. So what does a browser do if we have a focused element that we remove from the DOM? Well, it obviously does not know what's going on. So you're, you're going to get focus brought to the top of the document, basically the body. So that would mean users with disabilities uh, using just a keyboard would actually tab all the way into your page, hit the pause button, uh, click the pause button rather, and then get shot up to the top of the page. So it's really important to think about focus retention in this context. Um, we also have alternative state annotations. And what those are, those are pretty common. Um, like designers love to make hover interactions really pretty, but it goes beyond hover. It's, it includes stuff like your focus state, 
um, where you can map out the background color and the foreground color, um, even active state or press, depending on what kind of widget you're doing. But these are the, the stateful annotations that are required um, for someone to implement this properly. Um, number four here, minimum control size annotations. I, I left this as a separate um, type of annotation because it's, it's, it's really easy, but it's really easy to forget. So WCAG has a requirement. Um, I'm sorry if I, if I get the actual number wrong, but it's something like 44 by 44 CSX pixels is the minimum touch target size for a control. Um, and so if you're a designer and you're not considering that, you're gonna hand the developer something that's, that's really set up for defeat if you go below that 44 by 44 threshold. So it's really important that you document those dimensions. Now this one's one of my favorite um, types of annotations, which is focus order. So what we're looking at is a, a piece of UI and overlaying the UI, we have um, little blue tab stop indicators and those are actually enumerated. So we're actually describing what the focus order should be. Um, so that way the developer knows to implement it like that and actually it kind of holds their hand to, it actually drives in my opinion, DOM order, which actually means that we're gonna get a good reading order as well with that. So thinking about this from the start actually creates better components, better markup, and, and in turn, more usable by all your users. So reading order, we're looking at that same exact um, piece of UI, but instead of the enumerated tab stops, we have um, arrows that basically draw the user through, or um, draw you through what, how the user would be reading this content. All right. So I wanna get right into our example app. Uh, it's a completely fake app and it's called Awesome Recipes and it uh, lets you track and rate the recipes you cook. And just to get everyone here inspired, I have a, a very mouthful goal here um, with big words, but um, to create a set of designs that articulate the aesthetic, behavioral, and design-centric accessibility considerations, which will facilitate a rapid iterative de development. So now we're all inspired, we're gonna go, we're gonna start building this app. Um, so we're looking right now at the kind of overall app structure we have a, a common, we have a, a top bar, we have a heading, we have a section of stats, we have um, some filters and some repeaters, some cards or tiles or whatever you wanna call them that actually render each of the uh, given recipes. So um, before we actually show any annotations, I wanna go over our key here. Um, we have uh, some B and L teardrop indicators. That, that's a way, a quick way for your uh, designer to say, hey, this thing's a button, hey, this thing's a link. Um, we also have a little call out speech bubble um, that's kind of followed by an accessible name um, box. So that's how we can document stuff like alt text or what um, some icon button controls should have as their accessible name. We actually saw a bit of that with our uh, audio player controls. We also have tab order. I just, I just displayed the, the cool enumerated tab order thing. And uh, we have a, a little key here for uh, how you'd use that. And we also have some generic role name annotations. Uh, so you can say, hey, slap role main on this thing or, or whatever it might be. Um, I do wanna mention that this, either in this exact state or maybe it's been tweaked a little bit by the designer I work with, but uh, I actually originally came across these cool annotation things on the accessibility Slack channel. So I wanna, I wanna stress that there's a really, really awesome community out there of accessibility experts of all sorts. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of developers, a lot of designers, there's managers, there's marketing people, uh, but it's a really good resource. And I actually found this, got really excited, said, told my uh, designer that um, he should start using this and he got really excited and we use this uh, ever since then on all of our wireframes, it's great. Um, so let's get into our first component that we're gonna dive deep into, which is the recipe card. So we're gonna render one of these for each recipe. All right. So we're looking at a chocolate cake, kind of low fidelity. Well, it's, it's a wireframe, but um, we don't have any actual images. It's, it's kind of grayscaled right now. Um, but I wanna go over each type of annotation we have here. Um, this first one is, is really common and everyone should be used to seeing this if, they, if they've seen any wireframe. So we have stuff like measurements. We know that the card should be 277 pixels wide, 379 pixels tall. Um, the image should be 142 pixels and so on. But we also have some cool accessibility focused uh, annotations here, like the accessible name of this edit icon, this little pencil guy. Um, they'll have the accessible name of edit followed by the recipe name. So in this example, it'd be edit chocolate cake. And when you click that, it actually invokes the uh, edit modal. Um, really, really important um, here is that I've, we've marked this image 
for the given card as decorative. Um, it's, a, it's a tough one to wrap your head around. I'll, I'll actually get into some tips on how you can decide whether an image is decorative or informative later on. But we decided this image will be decorative because it actually doesn't add any um, useful information to the card because we actually have the, the heading there in the card right below it uh, that has the same information that the image conveys. In this case, it's chocolate cake. And we also decided that the, um, the edit icon thing is gonna be a button and the cook button at the bottom is gonna be a button. So more, more and more annotations for this one little card. We got stuff like box shadows, um, foreground and background colors, uh, but more interesting stuff is that we've decided on heading levels from the start. So um, if, I, if we back up all the way to this view of the whole app, uh, we, we decided up front how our heading structure is gonna be. So we decided recipe dashboard at the top, that's gonna be our H1. We decided that each of these stat headings are gonna be H2s and therefore uh, the next in line would be these H3s for the recipe card. So let's go back to where I was. And so we've, we've actually annotated that as such. Another interesting aspect here is we've actually mapped out what the focus indication is gonna be for each of the two controls. So um, this is really gonna drive home my point of a pattern library even more so. Uh, this this de designer actually just said default focus. And that really to the developer who has some context knows, okay, that, that's our pattern library's default focus. I actually don't need to do anything here. There's nothing special to be done. So let's just let our focus ring um, render like it always does for all of our controls. On the contrary, we actually, the designer decided to make a fancy focus indication for the cook button at the bottom because uh, he felt that it was a, a special control. And so it has these little array brackets on each side when you uh, hover or focus it. And we've actually mapped out that behavior here as well, that when you click it, it actually um, invokes the, the, the read version of the recipe. So you can view the instructions and ingredients, which actually is what my next slide's about. So now we're, we're, we're looking at the view recipe modal um, it, we're looking at a pretty basic modal dialogue. It has an ingredients heading and an unordered list of ingredients, and then a instructions heading, and then an ordered list of the instructions. We do have two form controls here though. We have a, <laughs> a rate the yumminess text field. So when you cook it, you can say, ooh, that was yummy. I'll give it a 50 out of 50, or no, that was terrible, 10 out of 50. And there's also a checkbox control to um, tell the app whether or not you caused a grease fire in making your recipe. So let's look at the tab board of this modal. Modals are actually really special when it comes to tabbing. Um, firstly, I, I wanna focus on this focus, no pun intended. I wanna focus on this alpha tab stop. Um, it's, it's annotated with that alpha character, the A, and uh, it's a special tab stop. And I'll, I'll explain why. So when I click this cook chocolate cake button, we render this modal. When the modal is rendered, we wanna shift focus to it because um, a keyboard user needs to be able to interact with this content um, and the user is presumably not supposed to interact with anything else beside the modal. So a requirement is to, to shift focus to either the dialogue or something inside the dialogue. We've decided here to move it to the heading and the heading is an alpha tab stop because we actually will tab from the heading to the X button in the top bar, then go through those two controls, then to the footer controls and back up to the top because it an accessibility requirement of modals is to trap focus, uh, what I call a circular tab order. Uh, but the, the heading will get skipped after you blur it, meaning when I tab from the, the, footer, the last footer control up to that top X button, and we're gonna skip that heading. So the reason we call it alpha is because it's only focused in the state of, in which you've just opened up the modal. So very similar, we have a kind of edit version of that modal. And uh, what we're looking at is instead of a, a list of ingredients, we have um, a list of pre-populated text fields with each ingredient, so you can edit them. Next to each field, we actually have a trash can icon, which will delete our ingredient. Um, so, you, so here's where you really edit your recipe. And similarly, we have those same type of controls, except for in the form of a text area for the instructions, which gives the user a little bit um, more room to uh, write some more verbose instructions. So here's how we would map out the accessible name. We're gonna say, so each, we, we made a decision up front that each ingredient is gonna be enumerated. Um, from a one base index. So we have ingredient one, two, three, et cetera. And so as a result of that, each delete button is actually going to uh, correspond with that index. So for the ingredient one, as you can guess, it would, the accessible text for the delete button would be delete ingredient N. And we've actually annotated as a button and we've annotated those two footer controls as buttons. And um, the, the only other interesting thing here I wanted to point out is uh, add another ingredient. 
Add another ingredient actually appears visually as kind of a link. It definitely doesn't look like a button, uh, but since it behaves like a button, we've decided to mark it up as such. So a user understands the purpose regardless of what it looks like. And um, here's where we could also map out functionality either here in, in some annotations or maybe in a JIRA ticket or whatever issue tracking might use where it's something along the lines of when you click, add another ingredient, a new text field is rendered, focus is shifted to that text field. Um, we also want to map out the behavior of uh, focus retention when you click delete. So this is another example. Remember, I'll tab to the delete button. And uh, what I'm doing when I, when I click it is actually effectively removing itself from the DOM. Um, so we need to, like I said, we need to shift focus. Otherwise, an AT user is going to be brought, or keyboard user is going to be brought to the top of the document and have to tab all the way back in. So here's where you might say um, clicking the delete button will focus the closest adjacent input. Or maybe clicking it will focus the ingredient section if you've clicked it within the ingredients. But once again, always think about how focus will be retained when it comes to interactivity. All right, so I want to take a look at this app structure um, and go over a couple of the, the structural roles, the landmark roles, if you will. Um, and it's always good to think about this from the start so we don't have to retroactively apply roles after we realize that we have accessibility violations for having content outside of landmarks. So we decided that heading the little hero bar is going to be a banner. Below that is where the main content starts. So the main content encapsulates those stats as well as the recipe cards. Really simple stuff, but often overlooked. Um, and then same, same, same deal here. We have tab sequence mapped out for each of the modals. We also need to do that on the, uh, the base page, the structural. So the first tab stop in our app is actually something we haven't seen yet in any of the wireframes. It's the skip to main content link. The reason we haven't seen it is because that skip to main content link is only visible in a, in a very specific state. It's hidden until you focus it. So when a user tabs into the page, it actually then is um, kind of slid in visually and focused. And then when you tab off of it or you blur it, it will go back to its hidden state. So that's the first tab stop. Next, we'll go to the, the menu item at the top called Awesome Recipes. Beyond that, we're gonna go through all the filter lists and then through to the cards. And uh, we've actually dictated tab order within the card here um, in turn. So we have the ninth and 10th tab stops are the pencil edit icon and then the cook chocolate cake button. So this actually tells the developer ensure that within that card component that you have this tab order specifically. So keyboard interaction, this is kind of a separate section. I just kind of wanted to show um, what that read only modal looks like when you're tabbing around. So let's pretend I just opened up this modal. Um, now I hit, tab, uh, I'm, I'm focused on the heading. Now I hit tab, focus is shifted to the uh, X close button. I hit tab again, focus is shifted to the rate, this, rate the yumminess text field. I hit tab again, focus is shifted to the checkbox for grease fires. <laughs> uh, then we go to, I cooked it, the, the footer control then to the close button, and then back up to the top. So that's, that's what visually the focus indication would look like in kind of a high fidelity fashion. And um, speaking of high fidelity, here is what our app will look like with fancy pictures. We have yummy chocolate cake and spaghetti and filet mignon um, images right there in the tile. And uh, this part is where we actually, this wireframe that I'm looking at now is where we would uh, map out the focus indications of all those controls. We just went over the tab order for them. So here's what they look like when they actually are focused. Um, and the only other noteworthy thing here, other than obvious, some, some measurements and some, some colors of borders is that we, here we actually document the fact that the recipe dashboard should be the H1 on the page. All right, that's awesome. Um, I wanna move over to dev and through the woods. Um, but before we do that, I want to talk a little bit about what designers should be paying attention to um, when they're handing these, these things off. And, your, your team dynamic might not be set up in a way where this is, is very possible, but maybe you can request it. Um, but if it is possible, we, we recommend taking a, a peek at a few things. So in terms of color and font, um, as a designer, you should keep your eye out for um, ensuring your colors are being used properly and uh, font sizes are used because that can have a huge impact on the usability of an app, um, as well as weights. Font weights are really easy to get wrong. Um, so it's always a good idea to make sure those are implemented properly. Um, focuses. I think this is the most important um, of these four points because it's actually a little tricky, even as a, as a developer, which I am, uh, to implement simple focus indications. And that be, that's because um, the DOM stacking order is, is a little complicated. And depending on how your components are orchestrated, if you have um, kind of uh, several buttons mapped out in a, in a row, 
um, they can actually start covering each other's focus indications up. So if, if you have a, a simple two pixel black outline for your button, um, maybe the right side of that focus indication is covered up because you have, you've, you've displayed flexed on your buttons and uh, the subsequent, the adjacent element is covering up the previous element's focus indication. So always take a look at that. Um, and obviously tab order, can't stress this enough. Uh, it's an important aspect and it should be tested for whether it's uh, the designer, the developer, or the QA, but it's a really important aspect of your app, as well as accessible names. So typos can cause confusing experiences for people. So make sure that those, those alt text and those accessible names are accurate. All right, so the devel development phase, my favorite part. Um, I've kind of just jotted down a bunch of random ideas here, or random pillars of the development phase, if you will. Uh, so these are in no particular order, but um, unit testing is definitely part of the development phase. End-to-end -end tests sometimes is, is a part of it as well, depending on how your organization is set up. Um, and continuous integration is a great thing to have set up, um, especially for my next point, which is accessibility automation. So I wanna talk about how accessibility automation can be incorporated into all three of those. So unit tests, if you're testing your, your component kind of in isolation, proving that it does what it's supposed to do, um, why not use an accessibility automation library to run that on your component in isolation? That'll help you catch really easy, low-hanging fruit accessibility defects from the start. That's when you're still, that's when you still haven't even pushed a pull request with your new feature. Same with end-to-end -end tests. End-to-end -end tests in their very nature get your app into all the various states. And it actually is, is the best way to test for accessibility because um, contrary to unit tests, it actually tests the app where the components actually live in, in a browser or a headless browser. And uh, since you're already getting your page into all the various states, you might as well run some accessibility automation in those states and spit out a report if you have accessibility issues. Um, but automation can only get you so far. Um, you inevitably must perform some manual testing. You know, um, Automation can't catch everything. Our, our, brain, our human brains are, are sophisticated and can decide things that robots can't for now. <laughs> and um, another thing I wanted to mention is, is that you should always be utilizing your resources. The internet is full of amazing things uh, as far as learning accessibility. Uh, reading the actual spec, like WCAG or the ARIA spec, uh, there's so incredibly much information there. Um, it might be a lot to take in. I wouldn't recommend just sitting down and, and reading it unless that's your thing. Uh, but take it, in, in, take it in stride and baby steps, if you will, and uh, read about maybe what's relevant to whatever you're working on right now. And slowly you'll start building up this knowledge bank of, of awesome accessibility information. Um, and I definitely don't want to um, miss mentioning the ARIA authoring practices. That I can't stress enough how awesome those are for me. Um, the ARIA authoring practices are, are essentially, in my mind, they're a set of, it's basically like a spec for you implementing a widget. So if you have a widget, let's say a, a tab panel, you go to the ARIA authoring practices and it will map out all the roles you need to use, um, all the relationships you need to have as far as DOM or uh, with attributes, all the expected keyboard interaction. Um, so it's, it's really awesome. They actually have working examples of a lot of them too. So definitely utilize that resource. I've already mentioned Ally Slack. Ally Slack, A11Y Slack um, is, is an incredible resource. The community is full of really, really awesome people. Um, I learn a lot just by scrolling through. If, I'm, if I haven't checked it in a few days, I'll, I'll go and learn some stuff because people will bring all sorts of questions to the table and, and experts and anyone else will jump at the opportunity to, uh, to help out. So it's, it's a really great community. And like everything else um, that developers look up, Stack Overflow, uh, they have accessibility stuff there too. Like there's some really, really good content and questions being answered on Stack Overflow. So I, I definitely recommend checking out the tags. There's some really cool uh, discussions surrounding mobile development there as well. So um, before I, I close this presentation and do some air quote live coding, very, very minimal, um, I wanna talk about the accessibility automation library we're gonna be using. It's Axe Core, um, it's powered by DQ. Um, so I'm a little biased, I, I really like Axe, but uh, it's, it's an open source, free to use accessibility rules engine that can run on a document or document-like structure. And what it does really is just run a series of checks and spits out a report with uh, some violations. It says, oh, this, you know, this button doesn't have enough color contrast. It's, it's ratios two to one. Um, and we're actually going to be taking our, our testing a step further with, with a new thing we're calling Axe Pro, which is in beta and free to use as well. Um, but I wanted to end off before closing this presentation temporarily uh, with no code merges until hashtag Axe Clean. Um, and that can be applied to whatever automation you're using. But the idea there is, is uh, don't merge any code until uh, there's no accessibility issues. 
And so um, I, did, I did gloss over that a bit, but your continuous integration might be running unit tests. If your unit tests fail when there's accessibility issues, that's a great way to ch check it. Or if you have some cool like Netlify preview deploy setup, maybe write a script that tests that to ensure that the, the new change is accessible. And you should make that a required check and you shouldn't, you shouldn't merge any pull requests until your act's clean. Definitely a good rule to live by. All right, so I want to bring us to my local recipe app server. I got my, I'm, I'm, I'm in the development phase, right? So I haven't, we're not on, we're not deployed. I haven't submitted a pull request or anything, but I have implemented it. And uh, I didn't want to bore everyone making me, making you watch me write code. It would be a disaster. That's, that's really boring. So I have a partially implemented app here. Um, and I just wanted to let everyone know that the wireframes we went through for the, for these cards and for this whole app are literally what was given to me, uh, to implement this app. And we use this for kind of some training courses. Uh, but what we're looking at is literally how, how we do, uh, designs and annotations at DQ. So there was no smoke and mirrors there. That's, that's nothing but the truth. Uh, so I have this, and as the heading <laughs> heading says, I have this, um, this app built, but there are some accessibility issues here. So let's look at how we can find those first. So I'm going to open up my dev tools. Yeah, I'm, I'm in Chrome right now. So I'm opening up my dev tools and um, there is, I forgot to mention, Axe Core has a, a free Axe extension that has uh, support for Chrome and Firefox. Um, and what you do is you, you click this big analyze button and it's, it's going to run Axe Core on the page and then tell me what, what went wrong. So I hit analyze within a matter of several milliseconds, we have our, our 12 violations that they found on this recipe app page. And uh, those, those 12 issues are encapsulated into two different categories. Um, elements must have sufficient color contrast as well as images must have alternative text. So let's actually take a look and see what we did wrong. Cause I mean, we thought about accessibility from the start. Well, I mean, come on, why, why are there any accessibility issues? So, oh, this beginner text is way too light green. I, I mean, I can hardly read it. Um, Users with color blindness might have a really, really hard time reading it or who are hard of sight. Uh, so Axe actually went ahead and, and calculated the contrast ratio for me and it said it's 2.17 when really it needed to be 4.5. So Harris did a terrible job as a developer implementing what was presumably an accessible color palette that was documented via the annotations. And actually, if we look back, um, <laughs> that beginner text in the wireframe does not look like what I've implemented. So clearly I've used the wrong color. Um, so we're going to fix that in a minute, but let's, let's take a look and inspect these images without alt text. Um, interesting. So each recipe card has this violation because the, um, the recipe image that we remember, we said, I really want to make a point that we, we said this was decorative from the start. So it looks like Harris did a really, really bad job implementing this as a decorative image. And I'm about to show you how we can implement this as a, as a uh, decorative image. So let me go over to my text editor. Uh, let's fix our color contrast issue first. Um, I completely cheated for <laughs> to make this go as quickly as possible. Um, and I put a little CSS comment of the actual color that the wireframe had. That was 00853E. Um, I'm going to hit save. And let's fix this decorative issue as well. So here is the source code. This is a React app. It doesn't really matter if you don't know React. You're looking at an image tag with a source attribute of the recipe.image. Um, but I didn't do anything else to tell assistive technology or the accessibility tree that this is a decorative image. Uh, so how I do that is adding an alt attribute with a value of empty string. So alt equals quote, quote. Uh, an alternate method is role equals presentation. And if I could spell presentation, um, I still can't spell. So I'm gonna just go with uh, alt equals empty string. It's perfectly fine accepted way. Uh, so I'm gonna hit save. Um, my cool dev server just auto reloaded the page. That was fun. So I'm gonna hit analyze again. Hey, we are hashtag acts clean, everybody. Woo, that is awesome. Um, but that doesn't mean we're, our testing's done yet. Uh, so to recap what we just fixed, we marked these images as decorative and we can see what that looks like in the rendered DOM. There's just this alt attribute with no value. Um, and we've also darkened this green color. So now we actually have sufficient color contrast. It exceeds 4.5 to one. So I wanna take my testing a little bit further with a little friend I call Axe Pro. Let me log into Axe Pro. And Axe Pro is an app that is built on top of Axe. And it actually, the bread and butter of it are really these guided tests. So I wanna focus on those. Um, 
guided tests are, are intelligent tests that will walk a user regardless of their accessibility expertise. This, this works even if you're a novice, even if you're really new to it. So I highly invite um, everyone who's new to the game to check out this free tool. Um, and it's just gonna ask you a series of really simple yes or no questions for the most part, and then do all the heavy lifting and kind of infer accessibility issues um, based on that. All right, so I'm gonna start with the page information tool. This is, a, this is our by far the most simple uh, tool. It's a, it's a total of a maximum of two questions. And it's going to, um, so backstory here is I just, I just opened up the uh, app again, and now I'm back in the test page. Um, I forgot to mention when I was saving my results, I'm in a, a, the web app, which is a separate tab. So I'm back in the testing tab, I'm gonna hit start. And uh, right away, it's just asking me, the page title is, in quotes, insert title here. <laughs> does, does it accurately describe the purpose of the page? Okay, it looks like Harris is really, really bad at his job and he forgot to replace the template string in the uh, title. So insert title here is not an accurate document title for this app. So I'm gonna say no to that question. And um, now it's asking me, is the majority of the content on this page in English? Uh, what it did under the hoods, just in case anyone was curious, is it looked at the HTML's uh, lang attribute and it saw it had en, so it's saying, is, is this in fact accurate? And yes, this page is in English. All right, so in less than a minute, we were able to find our, our title issue. The reason automation couldn't find that is because I actually had a document title. It had a valid value. If it was empty, of course, automation could say, hey, you're missing a title. But robots have no way of knowing that that's not the right title for this page. So that's where our awesome human brains come into play. All right, so we just finished page information. Um, I really like the, the vibe that the Axe Clean got me. So I'm, I wanna be Axe Pro Clean. So as we find these issues, what I'm gonna do is, is fix them on the fly. So before we even move on to any other testing, let's just fix this issue real quick and then validate that we've, we've fixed it in fact. All right, so here's my index HTML file. There's where my terrible title was. Um, here's where I'm gonna write in awesome recipes. Uh, that's the name of our app. I think it's a pretty descriptive title. Um, so I'm gonna put that there. And what I'm gonna do now is clear my previous run's results and I'm gonna run it again. Run another lap. So back in the test tab, in the Axe DevTools panel, I'm gonna hit start. And now it's saying the page title is Awesome Recipes. Does it accurately describe? Yes, I did it. And yes, it's still in English. So I just spent five seconds testing and validating and I have in fact created an accessible title. Hooray. So now we're hashtag page information Axe Pro Clean. That's gonna be a trending hashtag today. I have a, I have a really good feeling about that. Um, so th that's all fine and good. And I, I, I think that was really cool, but um, we really focused, if you remember, on this recipe card. And I'm a developer and I don't like reinventing the wheel. I like componentizing stuff. So actually, I, since I'm so familiar with this code, I know that all the recipes, we're, we're mapping over an array of recipes and then we're rendering a card for each of them. So they're all rendered in the same way. So to, to speed up my testing, I want to actually just test one card to make sure that they're all accessible. So what I'm going to do is showcase probably my favorite feature of, of Axe Pro, and uh, we call it scoping. Um, but really what that means is we're doing componentized testing. So it's going to allow me to isolate my Axe Core tests, the automated tests, to just a specific element on the page. And it's also going to isolate that same element for all the guided tests as well. So I'm going to hit change scope. And now it's telling me to choose the part of the page that I'd like to test. And uh, similar to a lot of dev tools experiences when you can do the, the point and click to inspect an element um, in Chrome that is called, let's see, what do they name it? Select an element in the page to inspect it, command shift C. Uh, so I can, I can use a point and click, this is great. I click on an element, um, but not everyone can use a mouse. So we went ahead and created a little mini DOM here in the bottom of the actual Axe UI uh, that lets keyboard only users as well as, as a, assistive technology users actually select elements, which we're really proud of. It's a really cool thing. And it tries to kind of notify the user of vital information so they can accurately make a selection. So I just selected my recipe card. I'm gonna confirm. Now I'm gonna hit analyze again because I wanna run Axe here and see what happens. All right, hello. We have Axe clean again in just this card, which is not a surprise because the whole page was Axe clean. Uh, so let's go ahead and save our results. Same thing. You'll notice actually this time we've pre-populated this field with the, with the accurate um, document title, just because that's usually a good way to name your test. Um, and before I, I kind of glossed over it, but it had pre-populated with insert title here, but I didn't want to spoil anything. But I'm actually going to name this recipe card uh, to tell myself, my future self, when I'm jumping back into testing what, I, what I've tested here. Um, if you don't like that convention, we actually let you add notes where it's like, Harris, 
find the source code in source slash components slash recipe card.js. You can put your, you leave a little, little note for yourself. Um, but now that we, we saved our results, now we have this componentization set up. Um, what I want to do is run some, uh, some other tools. The so page info one's fine and all and that was a good kind of structural uh, look at our app. But now that we're looking at this sp specific recipe card, I want to run through our uh, images tool. It's a really cool tool. It's just going to basically walk you through all the images in the chosen scope. In this case, it's the recipe card, the chocolate cake one. And um, it's actually taking screenshots right now. So let's do that. Okay, and it's done. And it went ahead and found four images inside of just this one recipe card. Um, the, the two that I'm actually going to ignore are the, uh, if you remember the focus and hover indication of this cook button has the little brackets. Um, those are hidden, so I don't really feel like testing them. I'm just going to actually focus on these two buttons here, or these two images here. They are um, the chocolate cake image itself that we remember, we said it was decorative, as well as the edit button, um, the little pencil icon, that's an image. So I'm going to hit next. And now it's asking me to select all the images that are used solely as decoration. And a rule of thumb here is if you were to remove the image from the page, would important information be lost? If no, then it's decorative. And we decided from the start, like I said, we documented it here. Um, we made that decision early on. So this is a really easy question for me to answer. Uh, but given that we added, we said, uh, we annotated this pencil icon with an accessible name, that already means it's informative because that, that's like, oh, we needed, we needed to convey something else here. On top of that, it's an active image. What we call an active image is that it's uh, an image inside of a clickable element. Uh, so that always means it must be informative. All right, so now it's asking me to select all the images other than logos that contain text. Uh, WCAG has some specific criteria with uh, images with text. So we need to ask that question really easily. Um, in this case, we do not have text. So I'm gonna go um, next. And now it's having me validate the, the accuracy of the accessible name. So it's asking me, does the accessible text tell you what the image is for? Accessible text should accurately describe what the image is and what it is for. So edit. Yeah, edit sounds good, right? Let me just check. Oh no, right, 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 right. Hearing edit over and over again isn't useful. I wanna know what recipe I'm editing. So we decided from the start, like I said, started with the design phase, we shifted left. Um, we have an accessible name of edit and then chocolate cake is what I'd expect to see. So Harris really is bad at his job. He completely overlooked that part of the wireframe. Shame on him. Um, let's answer that question as such. All right, so in a couple minutes, we were able to test all the images in my component, my recipe card. And um, it looks like we have uh, a bad image, a bad alt text here. So I'm gonna hit finish. Hooray, we have one issue found for images. I did forget to mention in this uh, web app, the Axpro web app, you can, you can view issues just like you can in the extension. Same kind of thing, it shows you the selector, the recommendation to fix the description of the issue. Uh, but in the spirit of hashtag Axpro clean, uh, let's fix this issue real quick. So back in the source code, I found the element, the culprit here. Their, access, their alt text is just edit. And if we remember, it's supposed to be edit followed by the recipe name. So I'm gonna open up a new template string and um, each recipe is an object and it has a name property, which is what I want here. So I'm gonna say edit and then recipe.name. I'm gonna just save again and I'm going to see if that worked. So let's go back through the guided tool. For images, I'm gonna blast through this for the sake of time. And I'm gonna select the same two images, yada, yada. I'm going to say this chocolate cake is still supposed to be decorative and the pencil is still not. And uh, the pencil is not a logo. And now here we are, here's what I was looking for. And the accessible text that it found was edit chocolate cake. So actually now I can answer yes to this and presumably, yep, there it is. No issues found in less than a minute. So I'm hashtag Axe Pro recipe card images tool clean. Woo, um, that's awesome. So let's do one more tool. Um, I wanna do the buttons and links tool, it's really useful. It will walk you through testing of your buttons and links as it sounds. So let's do that real quick. All right, let's get it started. So I'm gonna hit start again and it went ahead and tried to scrape all the buttons and links from this component. Um, and one thing that stands out to me is it only found one. This tool must not know what it's talking about because we totally said that this thing is supposed to be a button, this pencil icon, and actually on click it evokes a, a edit modal. So I think this tool's missing something. So I'm gonna say, uh, yes, I can see some button link elements that you did not highlight. So once again, we can use that same element selector that I used to choose the scope to um, 
choose the edit button. So I've clicked on that. I'm going to hit next. I just told the tool, hey, this thing's supposed to be a button or a link. And now it's similar to the uh, image tool requirement that we, we need good alt text on images. We also need good accessible text on um, controls like this, some interactive controls. You can't have a, a button or a link with no text. So it's important that the text is there, but also it actively describes the purpose. So uh, the question we're looking at now is, does the accessible name of each button link element accurately describe its meaning? Um, so for the pencil icon, it says edit chocolate cake. If you remember, we just fixed that issue. And so that, that fix actually propagated up to the accessible name calculation of this button. So I'm going to say, yes, that's perfectly what it's supposed to be. And the accessible text of the cook chocolate cake button is cook chocolate cake. So I'm going to say, yes, that's accurate. Now, beyond accuracy of the accessible name, we want to ensure accuracy of the role. So it's having me review the calculated role of each button link element and ensure its accuracy. So it went ahead and tried to, to figure out what this thing should be. Since it's just a plain old div, if you remember, we can look at it in the source code. It's just this div with an on click, shame on me for doing that. Um, and so it, it, doesn't, it doesn't know if it's supposed to be a button or a link. So here's where my human brain comes into play. And I say, this should be a button. I'm gonna actually pre-populate the cooked chocolate cake button as a button because it's marked up as such. So there's only one, one problem here. So I'm gonna hit next. And so we have, we have two issues with this. We have the fact that it doesn't have a role and then it's actually not accessible to um, assistive technologies. It's, it's not a tab stop. It's not even clickable with the keyboard. So we have two issues surrounding this one major problem. So I'm gonna save my results and figure out what I did wrong. All right, so I used a div instead of a button. That was really silly of me. I wanna point something out though. I talked about utilizing accessibility automation. Uh, that, doesn't just, that doesn't mean just some JavaScript you run in the browser. That can be static analysis of, of your code. So a common thing in um, programming is linting your code, which really is just, it will analyze it and find obvious problems with it. Um, and there's actually some awesome accessibility specific linting that can take place. And this isn't just specific to React. There's also, there's actually just static HTML linters that will tell you, oh, you have an image without an alt. So I wanna show you what would have happened if I didn't override this in order to do this demo. Um, I, I disabled the no static element interactions. Um, right away, if I didn't have that disabled, which I usually don't, it would yell at me because it's like, hey, you're adding some interactivity um, to this div. You need to use the right role. But I turned it off for the sake of this demo. So I'm gonna change this to a, a button. That makes more sense. So now we have to recap this button with an on click that will actually open our, our modal presumably and then the child image with the, with the right alt text now. So I'm gonna hit save. See if that gets me through to hashtag AxPro buttons and links guided tool clean. All right, hit that. Back in my test tab, I'm gonna open up the Axe extension once again. I'm gonna hit start. And this time, this is really promising. It said we've highlighted the two buttons and links we found. Um, and so this time it actually found my pencil icon uh, as a button. So I'm gonna say, nope, nothing's missing. Good job. So it's gonna capture some screenshots really quickly. And the accessible text is still the same. Nothing's changed there, so it's still accurate. Uh, but the important part here is we've actually have a slight change here. When we're reviewing the role, uh, it actually pre-populated the pencil as a button. Uh, so there's nothing for me to change here. So they're both actually marked up as a button is what this tool is telling me. Um, and then I'll, I hit next and I'm on the results page and I have zero issues. And I've done that in less than a minute. So um, that's what I had today is to demo Axe Pro, just to give you a little taste of what the guided tools can do. And um, let me go back to my slides. And um, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you for joining. I've been Harris Schneiderman. Um, I think we're going to share these slides, but if not, my Twitter thing is the Heresius. Um, you can find me or DQ on GitHub, and uh, we invite you to sign up for the X Pro Beta. Hey, Harris. Hey, Scott. That was um, that was pretty intense. I enjoyed that a lot, and then. Um, a lot of conversation happening in the chat room right now. I know I had to ignore it to, to stride through it, but I see there's 233 <laughs> unread messages. Yeah, well, there'll be a transcript of that we can go through at some point. I'll share that with you guys. Awesome. If there's any outstanding questions. Um, so I'm just going to in the Q&A box here. We had some questions come in. Sorry, AT is assistive technology. I just scrolled through and saw that I did not explain that. I apologize. Uh, all right, well, that knocks two off the list. Um, what is an accessibility automation library? 
Um, that can be, I mean, I, I, we kind of use that as a blanket term. So Axe is an accessibility automation library. Um, I would say uh, the, the linter, I think, is, is a form of automation and accessibility. So that JSX alley we're looking at. But it's really yeah. anything that um, with code, meaning no human interaction, will analyze a page for accessibility or, or in, this in the case of linting, some code. Uh, yeah, I think everybody's requesting an invitation for the Alley Slack channel. So, oh, yeah, I'm gonna ask uh, for one too. Reach out to someone you know who's in the channel or myself, and we can get you invited. Oh, okay, cool. I'll, I'll do that. Uh, Ricardo Z um, asks, why 56 PX, PX pixels? But I'm not sure what that was relation to. Oh, yes, that was the uh, minimum target size. Um, 56 was probably arbitrary. The designer in that case thought the control should be that large. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's just as arbitrary as how uh, wide that tile was. Um, the important thing to note there is that it exceeded 44 by 44 CSX pixels, uh, which yeah. is the requirement given to us by WCAG. Okay, fair enough. Uh, Steve Woodson would like to know, how do we include users with disabilities into our projects? Is there a network we could reach out to? That is a really good question that I don't have a good answer for. Um, maybe we can, we can do a follow-up. Um, I'm, we're, we're really lucky to have um, at DQ a ton of resources that use assistive, assistive technologies and have various disabilities. So yeah. we can usually leverage that. Um, so reach out within your company. If you have a large organization, there's a good chance that you have some uh, users with disabilities, even if it's color blindness or um, blindness or motor, motor impairment. Um, yeah. But I, I'm not aware of a, of a specific network. Um, so maybe we can get back to you on that one. Okay. Uh, Steve also asks, what systems do you recommend for such detailed annotations? Um, Ooh. It looks like there's many layers to the ideal annotations that could get uh, unwieldy quickly. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it was quite unwieldy even as I presented it, which is why we looked at the same recipe card like six different times. Yeah, it made um, me very hungry, by the way. I know, it's like lunchtime on the West Coast and I'm starving. Yeah, it is. <laughs> um, but no, um, I, I found those annotation key things on, on the Alley Slack channel and I sent them over to my designer. Um, the des I'm not a designer, so uh, I was hoping maybe he would be on the call, but uh, he uses UX pin, which is he just started using. UX um, pin? Yeah. Okay. UX pin is really awesome because it actually has a simulation mode. So, so the designer can actually um, not only just document uh, interactions, but they can actually make interactions happen, which is great. Uh, cause then the developer can pick it up. I will say that the, the code that it generates isn't necessarily accessible though, which, which right. can be a problem. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think, I think most of the design systems out there, w uh, support you importing custom annotations in. Um, so I, I, I'm sure Google would, would help you out there. Okay. Um, oh yeah. Could you later point us to the Slack channel that you mentioned? That's the hot topic for the day. Slack. It's, it's awesome. Uh, yeah, let's, let's send out a link after this. Okay. Um, oh, so Diana Nichols was asking how she can send the on-demand, um, this on-demand to a coworker. So sorry about that, Diana, but we will be posting the video to the, um, the Smashing Magazine YouTube channel once we're done. So you guys, the messages are going pretty quickly here. <laughs> um, does the image testing tool recognize SVG um, and further than that files inline base 64? Oh yeah, I thank you for touching on that. I completely dropped the ball there. Yeah, uh, if it detects image tags, which include base 64 images, SVGs, uh, background images, it makes a really, really hard attempt to detect ligature fonts and, and font icon sets. So we try to catch anything that, that can be interpreted as an image. Okay. Uh, Lisa Lescovi, Scovoy, I'm horrible with bad names. Uh, for tab annotation, how do you annotate it if pressing a button adds content which is focusable? For example, a pop-up menu or accordion section with links. I would probably separate the concerns um, and do like a, an, uh, a wireframe with the structural page wide tab order. And then um, in your comp or your wireframe for the specific 
drop down menu, whatever we're talking about here, have the tab order order within that mapped out. So then the developer can infer, okay, if, if I don't activate it, this is what the tab order, but if I do within that component, we'll have X, you know, one, two, three, and then presumably back outside of it um, for the rest of the DOM. So I'd, I'd try to separate those two. And maybe in the, in the ticket where you're, um, where you're passing this off the developer, you, you describe that. Um, an anonymous attendee. Could you talk about some of the elements besides modals that would also require circular tab order? Ah, um, that would require, I'm not sure how many require it, but um, uh, tab panels I've seen implemented with circular arrow key order same with like aria menu so if, if you're if i'm if i if i hit my tab uh my i have four tabs let's say i get to the first one that's active i hit the right arrow once twice third and back to the the fourth one uh, on that fourth one i'll actually cycle back to the first tab and the same thing with like menu items i've seen that um but as far as trapping focus like that it's really just dialogue elements okay um, Shana Sheed, um, is this information applicable to websites and apps? So we mainly spoke about website here. Um, I'm assuming, but it's always wrong to assume. Um, do the examples that you're showing work within apps as well? Um, so so like I guess apps it's... pro won't, uh, but a lot of these principles do for sure. Yeah. Um, if we're talking about like mobile apps, there's a whole different API as far as how you implement that. So instead of me setting yeah. an ARIA label, for instance, we'd set some accessible text property or something. Um, but a lot of modern like desktop apps are running some kind of Chromium or Chromium like thing. Uh, so that means you can totally incorporate accessibility automation into the building of those apps. Um, so, so kind of the answer is yes and no. Um, Axe Pro okay. itself won't work with a, a mobile app. Okay, yeah, I'd kind of assume because there's a whole different set of accessibility tools within Android, iOS. Right. So, um, Adam Height is asking, who's responsible for annotations? Is it a group effort? Um, should annotations go on wireframes or the actual designs? Um, good question. I think I don't think there's a right a right or wrong answer there. Yeah. Um, it really depends on your team. My designer that I work with a, a ton, um, he leans on me for a lot of the accessibility stuff. So I'm kind of the, the go-to expert for him as he's still ramping up. Uh, so that, that kind of goes into the collaboration. Um, so if, if you have an expert that's not on your team, maybe you, you incorporate them into that design phase and say, hey, what, what, what's the purpose of this thing? What should I annotate? What are some things we should look out for? Um, but no, it's, it's definitely not just on the designer to do that. I, I would definitely incorporate your whole team in that process. Um, and I think the annotations can be on anything. You, you don't even need to... Um, necessarily document them as act, as annotations. You could, if, if it works better for your team, you could have a separate uh, issue, GitHub issue or Jira ticket that actually describes each of the things. Um, UX pins cool. It has like a, a sidebar with documentation where you hover in it and actually highlights the associated um, UI, with which the documentation is for. Um, but uh, overall, I think just um, in something like a design review, if, if you're a scrum team, that's a great uh, time and place to at least refine the annotations or maybe add the accessibility specific ones with the whole team involved. Um, that, that will really like open the developers eyes up to what they're going to be implementing in the future and get them up to speed on the accessibility requirements. Okay. Um, just a side note here, Andrea um, from the Twin Cities um, mentioned it was a company called the we code so t h e w e c o dot com slash slash excels accessibility resources and they'll do um i'm not sure if it's just limited to companies in the area or not but it sounds like they do um a free usability review for people too if needed so oh nice That's um, awesome. yeah i'm sure there's i'm sure if people start looking there's there are services that would be more local that can probably help out with that very cool free is good too <laughs> yeah um, Justin is asking, are the graphics and iconography used for annotations available? For uh, you? Yeah, let me get, let me ask the designer to send them to me. I don't have them on hand, uh, but okay. maybe when we send out a follow up with like the uh, Slack information, um, we can send those along with them. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure we can. Uh, I, might, I might even be able to dig up the original Slack message where I found them in the first place. Um, okay. They're by no means our original ideas. 
Yeah, I think there's quite a few questions in here still that we can, um, if we can't fully answer them now, we can probably send out a group email to everybody that registered for the event. So, um, can you share us a recording of this session? Yeah, so again, this is gonna be posted on the YouTube channel once we're done. Um, what was the name of the VC code alley linter you'd uh, used? Yes, I used. Is there one right you recommend not for JSX? Ah, um, off the top of my head, I don't know it. Oh, shoot. We're working on some stuff with linters. I I've used an HTML one with accessibility. I don't know it off the top of my head, though. I, I apologize. Um, okay. I know there's a view one, there's an Angular plugin. Um, so, there's actually, there's, there's even um, linters for markdown files to ensure that your documentation, if you're using markdown, um, is accessible, which is really cool. Yeah. Um, Bruce is asking, when the Axe Pro evaluation is complete, does it generate a report or PDF that can be exported as evidence um, <laughs> yeah. for WCAG ADA compatibility? Um, it's not like a full VPAT if, if that's what you're asking, but you can by all means export the uh, issues in a CSV or JSON format, which is usually importable by any kind of issue tracking. Um, but it's, it's not like a, a, a pretty PDF report um, at the moment. All it is is the raw issue data of all okay. those violations. But it will tell you which ones were automated, which ones were for the headings tool, which one for the image tool, and so on. What's an example of an empathy event, um, Monica? There's an empathy. There, we've we've held some empathy labs, um, which will um, I'm gonna I'm gonna butcher this. I'm not I'm not an expert, but um, what 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 they really are is a series of stations that will simulate various disabilities and um, stuff like a a, a um, simulating tremors and trying to to scoop up soup and how some cool technology can kind of counteract the tremors. Um, and stuff like trying to trace through a maze um, in a reflection of a mirror or putting on goggles that might obscure things or, or grayscale things. So it's really just a lot of um, attempts to simulate different types of, of, excess, or of, of disabilities. Okay. Um, Lisa is asking, is Harris referring to CX pixels when he talks about the WCAG's minimum size? And what does that mean? Yeah, I think I have it in my notes, but I didn't actually, I wasn't in presentation mode. I think it's 44 by 44 CSS pixels is how WCAG describes it. So that, okay. those are CSX, CSS, yeah. Um, Diana Castillo, um, how do you recommend managing the focus color when using multiple browsers? I'm uh, just using the native one's the best idea. Uh, native one, I believe is compliant. Um, if you if your designer is excited about it, I'd recommend taking a look at at the at the various background colors that your app might have, and choosing a color that will contrast with all of them. Uh, if you want to get fancy and use a non-standard one, we we do use a non-standard one at DQ as part of our pattern library. It's, it was actually that that pinkish purplish ring that you saw in a few of those comps. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, my overall recommendation is yeah, if if anything if anything is better than nothing. So a lot of designers like to say. No, put outline zero important on everything. I don't want to see those ugly outlines. That's that's not acceptable. Um, yeah. that's, that's an that's an issue. So at the very least, use the browser default. That's there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I do I do know in earlier IE browsers the the focus indication was really hard to tell. Um, it was I think one pixel dashed or something. Um, yeah. So if the designers want to get creative, I totally invite them to because it's it creates a better experience for everybody. Um. <clears throat> Question here. The annotated wireframes that were spec for PX width and height images and buttons, are those the minimum measurements? Okay, this is, yeah, those are the minimum measurements since we never know what devices user are going to be on. Um, yeah. The designer will usually, like in UX pin, for instance, he'll um, take, take the design, show us what it looks like in our default uh, viewport size. I think it's 750 pixels, let's say. Uh, but we also have a, a, a mobile view of that same um, component. So in the case of the cards, it, we might document stuff like, hey, make sure that flex the flex wrap um, wraps them onto new um, rows and maybe shrink some stuff down. And actually, 
we, we did kind of do a little converting of the wireframes. We usually um, annotate with um, like EMs or something, uh, not pixels for that kind of reason. So it makes, you know, scaling, typographic scaling a lot easier. Yeah. Okay. Um, Miles is asking if Axe Pro will be available for Firefox once it's out of beta. Um, I'm not 100% sure. Um, the, the thing that our team is focused on is, is seeing how we can make a useful tool. Um, and so right now it's in beta. We just want, we want all the feedback we can get. Um, if the feedback's great, um, yeah, there's definitely a chance that, that we'll, we'll ship Axe Pro with Firefox and, and Edge support in the future. But right now we're just trying to gather information and see if it's, if it's a viable product. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Miranda's saying your cards visually have the edit button before the heading for the card. How do you keep people that jump from heading to heading from missing the edit button? Yeah, it's a really good point. That's been brought up before. Um, I, one could argue that maybe you could use absolute positioning to, to actually in the DOM and in, in the reading order, make that edit button below it. Um, but since we included the accessible text of uh, the, um, recipe name in it. So it, we, we're not causing any confusion at least, but, but yeah, maybe one could argue that that, that was a mistake and could be uh, enhanced by having the headings show up above the edit button in reading order. So it's a really good point. Okay. Um, and lastly, from the uh, attendee questions, uh, Cameron Lockerbie is asking, does this direction change at all when using a design system with accessibility included in the web components? Does what instruction? Does this direction change at all when using a design system with accessibility included in the web components? So which direction, the, the tab order or the? I'm not quite sure. If you're still here, Cameron, maybe you'd want to expand on that. <laughs> Sorry. But Sophie says we can, uh, oh, the best general practices. Do they apply to design software that has a set accessibility in it? Yeah, so I'm wondering if he's wondering if like, if you're using a certain set of components that already have accessibility built into them, do they change at all? Um, ah, so that's kind of like my, my point about pattern libraries, right, is um, I, I actually glossed over, and I'm sorry if I'm, I'm, I'm not answering this properly, but um, the having a toolkit of, of components in, in the form of a pattern library is great because that's actually less annotations you need to make for your for your devs when you reuse those so initially yeah. for building a new component i'm going to be handed like let's say i'm implementing that card i'm going to be handed that i'm going to write it in a very modular generic fashion and so now any other time we use that in the future the designer can just say use the recipe card or use the card component for this and maybe maybe there's some variations that we need to support so maybe we we kind of we iterate like that we, you know we implement a component in in the uh, in a minimal form for whatever we need and then if new requirements pop up um, then we'll, we'll try to see if we can pivot that component to support both use cases. Um, so you're kind of always iterating on them, but it definitely, it means it's, it's definitely a shortcut to have stuff built already with accessibility. So it's less manual testing you'll have to do. That's, that's less annotating you'll have to do. So it really just speeds up the process. Um, another question that just came in from Christine Kowalski. Um, I am working on a project and our SEO consultant um, wants us to repeat the paragraph of text next to an icon image in the alt text of the icon image and also repeat it uh, to the related H3 tag. Woo. Is this good practice or is this keyword stuffing? Keyword um, stuffing for sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that icon, if there's already adjacent text near it uh, that is the same, then I would just aria hide that icon if it's not serving a purpose. If it's actually clickable, then then maybe uh, give it a, a nice summary accessible name, but don't put a whole paragraph's worth of text as a label for a button. And then don't stuff more text into the heading because that um, AT users, as someone actually just mentioned earlier, uh, can navigate by headings. So yeah, like on voiceover, it brings up a rotor menu of all the headings and uh, seeing a giant paragraph's worth of text is not gonna tell a user what, what that section's all about. Or at least they're gonna in, have to dig through that information to find out. Yeah, in general, um, this being honest about your content is the rule number one. As soon as you start trying to hide text and stuff in other places, there's a chance you might even get penalized by the search engines. But right, good point. That um, that's a whole other thing. 
Um, <laughs> Shane is just asking how long do wireframe wireframes normally take to make? So uh, that can I, vary a lot. Yeah, I think it can vary a lot. I'm not a designer, so I actually don't know. Um, I know it's a, it's an intense process, and it's by no means can you slap it together in a day. Um, and I think it's just like developing, just like I said with the pattern library, it's very iterative. So maybe you come up with an idea, a proof of concept. Maybe you just have like a paper prototype, and you're um, and you're you're doing some usability testing with it, and then you move on to the wireframe stage. Uh, but I actually don't know on average how long it takes designers to do that because I'm not a designer and I don't make wireframes. <laughs> Fair enough. I consume them. <laughs> um, well, that's it for the user questions. Vitaly has some questions here, but I have a feeling we probably touched on a lot of them already. Um, so I'm just going to quickly open them up here. Um, so in regards to your workflow, how do you maintain accessibility over time? Um, is there any tips on how you can integrate that into your daily workflow to kind of make it just second nature? Yeah, really good question. I've tried to touch a tiny bit on that, but uh, let me expand a bit. So um, the, my point about um, treating accessibility defects like normal defects, don't, don't separate accessibility defects from normal ones. Don't let them sit and rot in the backlog. Prioritize them like the real defects. You know, you, the, a lot of times accessibility issues are, are true blockers, blocking people from using your content. So if anything, one could argue that they're, they're more, they should be a higher priority than some other uh, minor defects. Um, and so, you, you also should be incorporating, like I said, CI checks or, or some kind of automation where you can ensure at least some minimal accessibility has been implemented uh, before you're even pushing code. Um, that's a great way to easily um, catch issues and prevent them from even leaking into your, your dev server. And, um, and I think what, what we covered today is a great example of, of how you can um, maintain accessibility over time. Yeah. If, if you're thinking about accessibility in the design phase, you're setting yourself up for success already. So um, like it, what I would say for regarding your ongoing point about like, it, you know, it's a, it's a, pro a project that's already started. What do we do? We, we want to start thinking about accessibility. I would say um, initially maybe have some perform an audit on it so you can gather all the, the existing issues and um, triage them, prioritize them like we were talking about with defects and, uh, and track that progress on them. So, you know, maybe you can say we've been, we've been able to knock out seven accessibility issues per sprint while not creating new ones. Let's create a goal to have zero issues by next quarter or something. Um, that'll help you kind of come up with, with a nice process for your, your next new project to, to be accessible from the start. Okay. Um, if possible, ARIA should be the last matter of resort uh, as HTML should be good enough to make things accessible. Um, could you explain the role of the the web content accessibility guidelines as opposed to ARIA? Yeah, yeah. Um, so the way I think of WCAG or the web content accessibility guidelines, yeah. um, those are really just rules, right? So um, the 44 by 44 CSX pixels, that's, that's a rule. Um, <clears throat> double A 4.5 to one contrast ratio, that's a rule given to us by WCAG. Um, or guideline, I guess, is what they wanted to, wanted me to call them. Uh, and then what I, how I think of ARIA is actually, ARIA is a set of techniques to follow those rules. So ARIA will map out various attributes that will be consumed by assistive technology um, in order to create that accessible experience that those rules are telling us to do. So they, they definitely, they play nice together. And um, a lot of times, um, to, to, to the initial point, a lot of times semantics works better um, than using ARIA. So that's like, you know, to, to really draw out a, a watered down example would be uh, don't use div class button, role button, just use a button. You get a lot of stuff for free um, and there's a lot less for you to maintain there. Yeah, fair enough. Um, most importantly, because <clears throat> we never got a chance to ask it at the beginning, but um, are you a cat person or a dog person? Wow, <laughs> it's perfect that I chose this picture on my, on my ending slide. I'm a dog person. We have, we're looking at my cute little boxer name Ophelia here. Um, yeah. I love dogs. I don't have anything against cats, though. I just don't have any cats. I'm, I'm mildly allergic to. <laughs> we're all inclusive over here, so. All right, all right. Um, Nothing wrong with that. It's just, just good to know. Um, <laughs> well, um, yeah, thank you very much, Harris. Um, it was a pleasure to kind of see this in action for once. Um, I just want to let the attendees that are still kicking around, um, if you are a member and you um, want to review this or look at it later 
it will be available in the Smashing Memberships um, panel, but we're also going to be putting it out on YouTube once we get the, uh, the captions married up to the recording. Um, and then we have another webinar coming up with Paul Boag on the 28th of November. Um, we'll be calling Encouraging Clicks Without Shady Tricks. So Paul's been a, a long part of the Smashing family. He's done a lot of conferences with us and he, um, he's a pretty fun guy to watch. So hopefully we'll see everybody there. So on that note, Harris, um, have a good rest of your day. I'm thank you. And thank you, everyone. I'm, I'm scrolling through the chat. There's so many cool resources that everyone's sharing. This is an example yeah. of, of what the accessibility community is really like. So thank you. And I will try to see if we can get a follow up uh, with just a couple things people are asking for sent out to an email to all the registrants later. Perfect. Appreciate it. Okay. Well, thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, thanks again, Harris. And um, have a good day. Cheers, everyone.